Hello. Uh, this part I don't have to read. Uh, I'm Ron Kagan, uh, the CEO and Executive Director of the Detroit Zoological Society. Um, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us at the Zoo Animal Welfare uh, Public Lecture Series of the Detroit Zoo. Uh, our Center for Zoo Animal Welfare is dedicated to advancing captive exotic animal welfare science and policy to help ensure that zoo and aquarium animals around the world are thriving. Right now, there are 140 world leaders in animal welfare here at the Detroit Zoo for an International Animal Welfare Congress. This three-day symposium is addressing the ethical dimensions and global commitment to animal welfare. I'm pleased to introduce one of the leaders who's here. He's really a luminary, not a leader. Um, Dr. Mark Beckoff, Professor Emeritus of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Colorado Boulder. Dr. Beckoff is a fellow of the Animal Behavior Society and a past Guggenheim Fellow. In 2000, he was awarded the Exemplar Award from the Animal Behavior Society. Um, for major long-term contributions to the field of animal behavior. Uh, Mark is also an ambassador and a very close friend of Jane Goodall uh, and her Roots and Shoots program, and he's a member of the Ethics Committee of the Jane Goodall Institute. His main areas of research include animal behavior, cognitive ethology, which is the study of animal minds, behavioral ecology, and compassionate conservation. And he has published extensively, and I mean extensively, on human-animal interactions and animal protection. His work has been featured on 48 Hours, uh, in Time Magazine, Life Magazine, U.S. News and World Report, The New York Times, on NPR, BBC, and in a National Geographic television special play, The Nature of the Game, among many others. In addition, he regularly writes for Psychology Today, and the Huffington Post. Mark has published more than 1,000 essays, popular scientific and book chapters, and 30 books, and he's edited three encyclopedias. So I've got a lot of his stuff in my library. His latest book is The Animal's Agenda, Freedom, Compassion, and Coexistence in the Human Age, along with Jessica Pierce. He really wants me to share with you that he's also the master's winner of the Tour de France. So let's warmly welcome Mark Beckoff, who's not showing up on a bicycle. Good evening. Thanks for braving the weather. I was told in Boulder, Colorado today where I live, it was 80 degrees and sunny. <laughs> I know, and all my friends are writing me to say, we've got a ride going at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. And I'm thinking, no, I'm in Detroit. But anyway, I don't mean that in a negative way. So anyway, um, thanks, thank you for all coming. Um, I don't do a PowerPoint, so you'll have to listen to me and, and look at me if you can. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. The meeting that Ron was talking about has been really stimulating. Um, people who normally don't get together or talk to one another are talking to one another, which is, which is really the solution to any and all problems that we would have about keeping animals in captivity. And so the lecture is titled, <clears throat> the same title, <coughs> excuse me, as a, a new book that just came out last week. So... Um, I'm going to go through a talk, and I hope you have questions at the end. I mean, it would be great if you could ask questions um, as I'm talking, but then I probably wouldn't get through my talk. But um, I'm going to make some points. I have a point of view about um, keeping animals in captivity. Um, I'm also thrilled to be here because the Detroit Zoo is really the exemplar. It really is. I mean, I, I'm not a particular fan of zoos, in all honesty, but... If I were a non-human animal, I would probably move to Detroit, <laughs> although it rains a lot. <laughs> but they have good enclosures. 
So a couple of points I want to make is that <coughs> the animal's agenda should be our agenda. And, and basically, the animal's agenda would be that they want to live the best lives possible while we respect who they are and what they need. And, and in my field, you hear a lot about people saying, well, we're giving animals the best life possible or a better life. But it's important to realize that in the venues in, whoop, in, in the venues in which animals are used, a good life is not a, a better life is not necessarily a good life. Okay, it's the best we can do, and, and I applaud the efforts of a lot of people, but we shouldn't conflate a better life or the best life with a good life. Okay, and I'll be returning to that point. Um, it's important to incorporate ethics into all discussions. And sometimes when people talk about that, they get a little uneasy, but, but it really is. Um, there are right and wrong and better and worse ways of interacting with non-human animals. My big conclusions that I'll come to at the end um, would be that we need a revolution of heart. We really need to let our feelings about what's happening motivate our actions on behalf of the other animals. Um, good people can do bad things. So my attitude is that if I'm going to criticize something that's happening, I'm going to criticize the position of the people, not the people themselves. I mean, criticizing people and getting in their face, you might as well just go home. Okay, the minute they get defensive, they don't want to listen to you and they're going to go home. So there's things I hear that I don't particularly like or favor, but that's the way it is. And there's people who listen to me and don't like what I say. I don't favor my position, but I want them to respect me. And if I want them to respect me, I need to respect them and listen to them. Okay, I'm not saying it's easy. And some days, you know, you just want to go, I'm out of here. <laughs> but that's the way it goes. Um, I look at zoos as one venue in which humans are dominating nature, and I don't necessarily mean it in a bad way, but we are. We're making decisions that favor hum often making decisions that favor human interests over those of non-human animals. <clears throat> and one of the main problems is there's just too many of us. I mean, we're just growing in leaps and bounds, and we're invading and trespassing into the habitats of non-human animals, which is one of the major problems, okay? So I'm going to start off with a great quote. Some of you may know this. It's from Henry Beston, who wrote a wonderful book back in the 1920s called The Atomost House, and it raises almost every issue <clears throat> and more about which I'll be talking. So Mr. Beston wrote, we need an other and a wiser and perhaps a more mystical concept of animals, remote from universal nature and living by complicated artifice, man and civilization surveys the creature through the glass of his knowledge and sees thereby a feather magnified and the whole image in distortion. We, pat we patronize them for their incompleteness, for their tragic fate, for having taken form so far below ourselves, and therein do we err. For the animal shall not be measured by man, in a world older and more complete than ours, they move finished and complete, gifted with the extension of the senses we have lost or never attained, living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren, they are not underlings, they are other nations, caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth. Uh, I want to just say this was written a really long time ago. It's very profound and prophetic. So there's a lot of gems here. So some of my major points that I'll be returning to is we do patronize non-human animals, and I'll just refer to them as animals now, but humans are animals and we should be proud of animals. Animal welfare science, which is concerned with giving them the best life possible, patronizes them often in the name of humans. And there's lots of debates going on about this. I'm not saying that it's a very clear... Um, argument that we should be always doing certain things in the name of humans. There are some people who think that we, shall, we should, and there are others who think that we shouldn't. Non-humans are not incomplete. I like to say they are who they are, not what they are. 
and we're not the template against, we, against which we compare other animals. Because when you think about it, there's lots of non-human animals who do a lot of things that we can't do, and we do things that they can't do. They do things that they need to do to be who they are as a member of their species. So when we say they're incomplete, it, it sort of implies that we're complete. And <laughs> all we have to do is pick up the newspaper to know that we're not complete, that we don't have the answer for all the questions at hand. They're not below us either. They're not less than us. Once again, they are who they are. And the reason that I stress that is because oftentimes the word below means less valuable or disposable. And then when we say we're higher, it means we're more valuable, more important, or you know, less disposable. So they're not below us. They're not less than us. Once again, they are who they are, and we need to respect them for whom they are. And that's what drives a lot of my research into animal cognition or animal smarts and animal emotions. So the reason that I'm really pleased to be at this meeting is because there's lots of misconceptions about what life in captivity is all about. So there was an article a few years ago in Scientific American that claimed that life in the wild is hard. In captivity, it's easy. I mean, that's ridiculous. Life in captivity isn't easy. Captive animals don't have all they need, which is precisely why we're having this meeting and which, precisely, which is precisely why there are good and lesser zoos. There, there just are, okay? And like I said, I'm not a fan of zoos, but... What's going on in Detroit is really an amazing achievement to give the animals, if you will, as much freedom as they can have within the confines of being captive individuals. And I'll return to that in a bit. So, you know, if life is so easy, why, do, why, are we, why am I at this meeting, right? I mean, even if I disagree with people, I really believe that they all have the motivation to give the animals the best life that they can but their conception of what the best life that they can give is different from mine, okay? Why do zoos have enrichment programs? Why do they spend a fortune trying to make, if you will, semi-natural habitats, right? I mean, old zoos were just concrete and jail bar cells, and that's just what people were content with, okay? One of the major... Um, Topics in this meeting is the notion of reform, and I'm going to get back to that, but I know a lot of you don't think about these issues like I do every single day. So what I'll be leading to will be a consideration of how to reshape what zoos are all about. Okay, so almost calling for a paradigm shift in how we view zoos and zooed animals. Okay, and I'll be coming back to that, but I want you to know that... Um, it will entail some radi radical changes in how we interact with other animals who, um, who we choose to keep in captivity, and we just do. And as Ron Kagan, who just gave me that lovely introduction, <laughs> thank you, um, notes, good care does not equal good welfare. That's a, it's once again a really important message, and frankly, I hadn't been thinking about that until Ron and I talked a lot, and he wrote a paper a few months ago on reform in zoos. Good care does not equal good welfare. Okay, so what have captive animals lost? Um, <coughs> philosophers and others like to call it agency. They've lost their autonomy to make choices about how to live, okay? And what they've lost is, you know, they've lost their ability basically to choose how to live and how to control their lives. Those are kind of the big C words. And a lot of what we're doing today is motivated by what are called the five freedoms that were developed in the mid-60s, particularly because of the deep concern about the welfare of food animals in the United Kingdom. So the five freedoms were freedom from hunger or thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, or disease, freedom to express most normal behavior patterns, and freedom from fear and distress. And one of the things that Jessica Pierce and I point out in our book, The Animal's Agenda, is that the freedoms are really more about constraints and deprivations than freedom. 
Okay, I mean, sometimes it's you know hard to know why that word was used, but it was used, and people have you know built off of it. You know, so we ask the question: What kind of freedom is it? Um, is it the question of whether a chicken would rather have 68 square inches of living space or 72 square inches of living space? Would an elephant rather have one acre to roam about or three acres? Okay. So one of the things about the freedoms in terms of giving animals, if you will, more of what they need is that it's a feel-good thing. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of people who know there's really no big difference between a one- and a three-acre enclosure for elephants. I mean, they, they need Detroit <laughs> um, without the ring. No. Um, so one of the things that I like to focus on, because a lot of people don't know about these animals, I call them poster animals. There's an animal called Marius the giraffe, Harambe the gorilla, Tilikum or Tilly the orca who lived in uh, SeaWorld, until recently, he died. Packy the elephant, and a polar bear named Senja. Okay, these are animals among the group who have really caught public attention. Many of you know might know about the documentary Blackfish, about um, Sea World, and basically, you know, what's wrong there. Okay, so <clears throat> Senja is a really good one to focus on. <coughs> it's a recent story. So Senja living at Sea World died soon after her best friend of 20 years, a polar bear named Snowflake, was shipped to the Pittsburgh Zoo to make more polar bears who were then going to live their lives in captivity. Okay? Um, people pondered whether Senja died of a broken heart. Well, she may have. If you've lived with a dog, you know how dogs miss, your rel- miss their best doggy friends and their human friends. They mope around. And there's lots of stories out there of some dogs who just don't recover from the loss of a good friend. So while people pondered why Senja died, I think a good feeling was that she lost a best friend of 20 years. They took it away. They, they just took her away. She missed her. That that's, was a best friend. That's all she really had living in her cage. Okay. Um, we can also consider the plight of captive giant pandas. And sometimes people get upset when I say this, but we don't need any more giant pandas in captivity. The giant pandas who are uh, are born in captivity are not going to be released into the wild. One of the things that I've learned at this meeting and I've thought about before was that when people see these animals, they sometimes think, well, there's lots of them and things are just great in the wild, but they're not. So sometimes when we keep these animals who are very charismatic money makers, what happens is people forget about the plight of wild pandas and that we're not saving their habitat, for example. Okay? But the fact of the matter is these animals who were born in captivity are going to spend the rest of their lives in captivity. They just really are. I recognize people disagree about whether this is a good or a bad thing or the right or wrong thing to do. My point of view is We don't need any more captive giant pandas. What we really need to do is work hard to preserve their natural habitat. I'm not saying this is easy, but I think that's what we really need to do. So Marius, a giraffe in (coughs) Copenhagen Zoo, became the poster animal, if you will, for how animals can be treated in zoos. Some of you may know his story, some may not, but he was a young giraffe who was killed at the Copenhagen Zoo because he did not fit into the breeding program at the zoo. He was otherwise healthy and happy. And then the zoo said they euthanized him. And zoos like to use the term management euthanasia to refer to killing otherwise healthy animals because they're being managed because they don't fit into their gene pool. And Marius was killed because he didn't fit into the gene pool And he was also killed despite the fact that other zoos, wildlife parks, had offered to take him. So, personally, I find that reprehensible, inexcusable, that it should never have been done. But zoos also say they euthanized him. And if you've ever, I mean, many of you have lived with companion animals who you've had to put to sleep. It's a really horrible situation. But we do that not when they're healthy. 
We do it when they're terminally ill, when they're in incurable pain. So I coined the term zeuthanasia to refer to the fact that these animals are being killed, but they're otherwise healthy, and they don't fit into a zoo's plan, so therefore it's okay to get away with, you know, to do this. I actually thought it was really rare, and I think it is quite rare in the United States, but it's not rare throughout the world, and the BBC had a report that listed up to 6,000 animals being killed because they do not fit into the long-term plans of a zoo, okay? So I think of words like euthanasia. People also use the word culling, for example, or dispatching. I'm a wildlife biologist. I hear about, oh, yeah, we're dispatching wolves. Well, they're not dispatching them to go to the local 7-Eleven. <laughs> they're dispatching them because they're killing them. They're sanitizing the act, okay? So zeuthanasia calls attention to the fact that these were otherwise healthy animals. And one question I like to ask is, would you do it to a dog? And when I ask that question, people really get, inc they're incredulous. They'll say, well, of course not. Well, giraffes, polar bears, other animals are no less sentient or feeling than your dog. So why is it okay to do it to one of a member of that species rather than your dog, okay? So I'm just throwing that out as a question and, and I really would like to hear from you because I really know, need to know more about how people think. So one of the areas that I work in is called compassionate conservation, and it's a very rapidly growing international field. It's interdisciplinary. It pulls in biologists, psychologists, sociologists, people in human-animal studies, anthropologists, economists, political scientists. And <clears throat> basically, compassionate conservation is trying to push forth a protocol and an agenda that really says that Killing is not good. And that, in, in effect, if you go back and look historically, killing animals in the name of conservation hasn't worked. Sometimes it's a quick fix. You know, you kill all the wolves or coyotes or other animals in the local area, and you don't have to worry about them for a while until other animals fill in their niche. The guiding principles for compassionate con conservation are first, do no harm, and that's just a commitment to prioritize non-invasive approaches in conservation research. Anybody who's read about conservation or knows about the history of conservation knows it's a very bloody history. It just really is. And I'm not faulting the people who years ago just decided kill wolves to save caribou, kill wolves here to save wolves there. There's lots of examples now in terms of killing one species of bird to save other species of birds, killing cormorants to save salmon in Oregon. So these situations still arise, killing members of one species to save members of the same species or killing members of one species to save individuals of another species. First do no harm says this isn't really good. The second basic principle is that individuals matter in conservation practice and when we interact with them in different venues. Individuals matter. Conservationists often play what I call the numbers game. So they'll say, well, there's a million brown rats. They're invasive. So we really don't, it doesn't really matter if we kill 10,000 of them. But for each of the 10,000 rats you've killed, you've killed a life. You've killed an individual. So compassionate conservation focuses on the well-being of individual animals. And in a sense, it's a real paradigm shift by saying the life of each and every individual matters and that we can't just dispose of Joe because there's a million other members of the same species to which Joe belongs. Another tenet is valuing all life, wildlife. Um, compassionate conservation is also concerned with situations of captive animals and I'll return to that but like once again one thing that compassionate conservationists are concerned with would be breeding animals who are then going to spend the rest of their lives in a cage okay well I'll return to that in a bit and the other is peaceful coexistence is the ultimate aim of compassionate conservation practices 
And I know I live in Boulder, Colorado, and it's a pretty fluffy place sometimes. And people go, oh, yeah, peaceful coexistence. You know, you can hang your crystals up and everybody will get along, blah, 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 blah. But it's, it's not so lofty at all. It really is a goal. And is it attainable? Well, I believe it's attainable. Will I or many people in this audience live to see it? I just don't know. But I don't mean that in a negative way. Because one of the things about working on behalf of other animals in different venues is if you're expecting a gold star in your head for each and every good act or good thought, y y you might as well just do something else. It's, it's a long-term progress. And once again, that's why I like meetings like this. I'm frustrated. I hear things that just really make my blood boil. But we're putting the ideas out on the table and maybe generations from now, we will realize these aspirational goals. It's going to take a long time. So if you're impatient, you better just go do something else. Um, on top of compassionate conservation, <coughs> I developed this idea of personal rewilding. And I'll just make a few comments about it, because to me, it's a very important move on a very personal level, where people make a transformation um, I look at rewilding as undoing the unwilding. The unwilding can come from sitting in school, like young kids just sit inside all day playing with their little electronic gadgets rather than getting off their butts and getting out into nature. Um, it comes from the media in terms of the misrepresentation of animals. One thing is, you know, you just turn on the news and when there's some horrific event, a lot of newscasters will say, oh, they're just behaving like animals. And then they'll write it off, and that's supposed to suggest that, well, you know, animals are always aggressive, and they beat up one another up all the time, which is not even close to being the truth. Rewilding also may, means to make wild again, okay? And so what I really like to think about is that, and I developed this idea, so in conservation biology, rewilding refers to the original efforts to build corridors where animals could roam absent human intervention. So one of the most famous ones is called the Y to Y rewilding project, the Yukon to the Yucatan. So that involves underpasses, overpasses, just involves building corridors where animals can move without being negatively influenced or influenced at all by humans. So one day, <coughs> excuse me, I was walking with my dog, and I used to walk him every morning and take long runs, and we'd have these wonderful conversations. And we started bouncing out ideas about building corridors of compassion in your body. So this book I wrote called Rewilding Our Hearts, Building Pathways of Compassion and Coexistence really mean that we listen carefully to what's happening in our heart, and then messages go through your body, they go to your brain, they go to your muscles, they go to organs that cause you to act, and then you do something positive, okay? So I like to think of this rewilding our hearts process as acting from the inside out, okay? A lot of people don't like that. I mean, I'm a biologist, I'm a field biologist, and really when you start talking about compassion and coexistence and sympathy for other animals, people just roll their eyes and they'll say, oh, you know, you're a scientist. Science has to be objective. That's one of the myths of, that people try to pull is science isn't objective. You give the da same data set to five people, you'll get 10 different interpretations of what's going on. So this isn't a negative comment on science. It's just to say that scientists are first off people who have a point of view on the world. Okay, so when I teach, I like to use the word compassion and sympathy and cooperation, for example, because if we don't factor those words into our vocabulary, they'll never get there. So I see rewilding as really being tied in with compassion and conservation because it focuses, once again, on individual animals. And we're all moving through the world so fast. There's demands on our time. So one of the principles I come back to is called biophilia. Some of you may know this, some may not. But biophilia is basically the idea that we have an innate attraction to nature. 
There's been good research that shows this. You know, we take walks or go out when we're having a hard day and all of a sudden we feel better. Or you see a, a bee or a bird or a squirrel or, or a tree or a plant. It doesn't really matter who the organism is. And it makes you feel better. And so the idea of biophilia really is that we have this innate attraction to nature. It's almost in our genes. So I build off of that to say that the rewilding process is not that difficult. It may take some work, depending perhaps where you live, but it's part of who we are. And so one example that I give is when I have to go to New York City for one reason or another, I go to Central Park, and I was walking through Central Park one day, (coughs) and there were these two kids with, it was either their mother or a nanny. She was on the cell phone. (laughs) I mean, she she was paying no attention to these kids at all. And I was watching squirrels playing, and they said to me, oh, mister, what are you doing? And I thought, oh, I'm in New York. If I start talking to two kids, I could get arrested. (laughs) But I decided, oh, what the hell, I'm going to talk to them. So they watched me, and they said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm watching these squirrels playing. I mean, it wasn't five seconds before I had these kids totally engaged. And then I said, oh, do you live with a dog? And on the one hand, I was hoping they said no. (laughs) But on the other hand, I thought, well, maybe they do. And they did. So I just said, well, you know, squirrels are mammals. And I went through the whole sort of taxonomy. And they like to play like your dog likes to play. And I had them watching, and they were going, oh, look at that. Oh, he's chasing. Oh, look, he's jumping on her. And then mom or nanny said, we got to go. And I heard one of the kids say, I want to come back. And I heard mom or nanny say, we will. I don't know if they did. I was leaving the next day, thank goodness. But um, but anyway, um, there's an example of rewilding in an area. Another was I got a letter from a woman in Chicago who lived in an apartment, and she put plants on the roof of her apartment, and really within a year, she became the resident insect and bird expert. So people went to her to ask about local birds and insects. And then I heard from a woman in California who started a rewilding club. So what I think is coming from this is the fact that, I mean, I live in Boulder, and I've lived in the mountains for years. Rewilding really been just walking out of my front door, and my nearest neighbors were cougars and black bears and foxes and coyotes and all sorts of insects, it was not very difficult to rewild. It wasn't always fun, but it was not difficult. But the squirrel example in Central Park and the woman who made a garden on her roof show that we can do it, okay? And I think you all know what I mean. Whatever gets you, gets you. So summarizing what rewilding is, it means we're not we, that we not only see and sense other nature, but we work to become them. I did field work for years on coyotes. I studied Adelie penguins in Antarctica. And the first thing I would do, being trained as an ethologist or an animal behaviorist, was I tried to become one of these animals. It's hard. There were things that they did that I would never do. I'm sure there were things that I'd do that they would never do. But I like to think that I would become them and I would become coyote or penguin or a wolf and understand how they function in their world. It means behaving from the inside out. It means nurturing our sense of wonder. I do a lot of work with Jane Goodall and her Roots and Shoots program, and kids are the answer. I mean, it's not like we're all over the hill, but we need to nurture a sense of wonder and curiosity about the world in kids, or else they're not going to get it. It, it just, and it's going to be harder and harder as they become more electronic, electronified. I'm not, I know that's not a word, but you know what I mean, more hooked into devices. Rewilding is also about be, being nice, kind, and compassionate and empathic towards other people. The thing about compassionate conservation and rewilding, the notion of rewilding, is that Every individual counts, and every individual is a stakeholder. And I think people who think that we're only going to work for non-human animals in the current world just have a false view of the world. We need to factor human animals into the equation. Um, When I've been in Africa, you know, you meet a Maasai, and they have a cow and a goat. (coughs) That's the resources. So if an elephant or a lion kills one of them, they've lost 50% of what they have. 
I don't want to lose 50% of what I have. And who am I, you know, a white guy living in Boulder who has a pretty good life, to be honest with you, telling them that they shouldn't do something. So what I really like about rewilding and compassionate conservation is we're all stakeholders. And to make, to make a headway in the future, we're going to have to accept that fact as hard as it is. In rewilding, I've also developed what I call the 10 Ps, and I'll just list them for you now, but somebody asked me a couple of days ago, you know, how do I make it through the, you know, a day? I mean, I mean, I do have a pretty good life, but my email inbox is usually filled with horror stories about the way in which animals are treated. So I came up with eight Ps of rewilding, and they morphed into 10. Proactive, you need to be proactive, positive, persistent, patient, Peaceful, practical, powerful, passionate, playful, and present. What it really comes down to is that we, this putting out the fires idea is just going to end soon. I like to think the, the world is tired. The earth is tired. It really is. It's fatigued. It's, people say, oh, everything will be okay because our planet and ecosystems are resilient. They are to some extent, but I think the rubber band is being pulled to the point where it's just going to snap someday. Being positive. Um, I was lucky to grow up in a very compassionate home, and my dad was just one of the most positive people I've ever met, even in very deeply difficult times. Negativity is just a time and energy suck. And if you want to get kids involved in something, you need to show them the positive side. So... And I don't mean it as a ploy, I just mean there's a lot of good things happening, there's a lot of bad things happening, but I think if you want to retain your energy for doing some activism on, on behalf of other animals and other humans, you need to be positive, persistent, patient, meaning these changes aren't going to happen, peaceful. It's hard. I wish I knew years ago what I know now is embrace your enemies. You don't have to invite them over for dinner, but you really have to embrace them and listen to them. You can agree to disagree, but this meeting is a good example where we have people from all sides of the issues of keeping animals in zoos, and we just need to talk to one another, or else you just can go to meetings and preach to the converted and go home and pat yourself on the shoulder and realize that you probably didn't make much of a difference at all. Practical, we need to set practical goals. Powerful, I do a lot of work with young girls, and you need to empower them that they count. It's interesting that the animal protection movement is predominantly female. Just is the case. Be passionate. Just pick something and go for it. Playful. My dad always used to say, at the end of the day, you need to step back, turn your brain off, look at yourself in the mirror and laugh. <laughs> One of my favorite playful things is I'm, a, I'm an addict for watching bike racing and tennis. People know that, that if Roger Federer is playing tennis, don't ask me out for dinner. And I like to twirl Twizzlers in good single malt scotch. <laughs> I do. I, I like good single malt scotch. I like Twizzlers. So I just kind of sit there and play with it. But what it really does is it just removes me from the, it removes me from a lot of junk that comes in, okay? And being present. And that I tie that into being passionate. So I think that there's hope. One way to rewild, like I said, is rewilding classrooms, rewilding education, and rewilding um, the media. The media is very, very important. And I think kids are the ambassadors of, it, of the future. So what I want to do is end off with a discussion of reform, because this meeting that I'm at centers on this notion of reform. And I look at I was thinking of what reform means, and I think it, to me it means reshaping, you know, reforming, reshaping something. And it could be reshaping our hearts, reshaping our feelings about things, and then having that translate into reshaping our actions on behalf of other animals. Okay, I'm going to put the humans aside now because although there are people who think that we're all zooed animals, um, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I, it's, just, it's too depressing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So reform, in my eyes, would call for a paradigm shift, and it would call for radical changes in how we interact with other animals, including those who we keep in cages of all different sizes 
and shapes. So this is basically a list I read yesterday in my talk, and it's just some aspirational goals, okay? So this is more focused on reforming zoos as we know them. It's not going to happen overnight, but I think it can happen over time. <coughs> the one would be stop captive breeding. There's been a lot of discussion at this meeting um, about a topic that I had not really thought about very much, and that would be putting rescued animals into zoos for rehabilitation. So it's a way of making zoos sanctuaries. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of move towards that. Some people are very resistant to it. Some people would like to open it up. But if we stop captive breeding, then we'll have room. Because one thing people will say is, well, we don't really have room for these animals who are you know, rescued, injured, rehabilita animals who need rehabilitation because we have all these animals. The fact is that most of the animals who are captive bred, I don't want to say all because there are a few exceptions, are going to spend the rest of their lives in cages. They just really are. On occasion, an animal is reintroduced to the wild. They're not reintroduced, they're introduced. They use the word reintroduced as if these animals had lived out there and then going back, they're not. They're introduced to the wild. Another would be stop shipping animals around as breeding machines. That sounds harsh, but that's basically what happens. Zoos will take elephants and just ship them around to make more elephants. Polar bears, other animals, I mean, you know. And what that means is they're breaking up social groups and friendships like Sencha, the polar bear. Just stop that. Um, I call it musical animals. I mean, these animals care about what happens to themselves, their families, and their friends. And so you're just breaking up social groups. And the interesting thing is, Typically, we don't do that with our companion animals. I gave a talk last week at the Dumb Friends League in Denver, and they had a whole bunch of dogs who were living together, who were, who were if you will, given up together, and there were big signs saying that these dogs will only be fostered or adopted together. Why? If you, Like I said, you know dogs can get broken hearts. You know they miss their friends and their families. Stop killing animals because they can't contribute to the breeding pool. Just stop doing it. Just find homes for them or keep them there. Stop calling these zooed animals ambassadors for their species because they're not. I've been teaching a course at the Boulder County Jail for more than 15 year, years. And I, I, I've been teaching animal behavior and conservation biology. And it's, it's a turnover, but I've been working with people from pickpockets to serial killers. They're not ambassadors for their species. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm not either. Well, maybe I am. No. <laughs> Give me another glass of wine and I'll tell you what I really think. No. But I'm not, a, I'm not an ambassador for my species. So stop calling these animals in cages ambassadors for their species. And we also need really to come to terms with what zoos do in terms of education and conservation. People disagree we all know people who said they've gone to zoos and they've become a biologist or a conservation biologist or they've become interested in other animals. They may have. So I'm not going to say that zoos do no form of education. But the bottom line is, do, do they educate in a way that a sufficient number of people do something on behalf of other animals that justifies keeping yet other animals in cages? Okay? To me, that's a fair question. Okay? And there's not much evidence for that at all. Once again, people disagree, but, but really even some of the studies that have done shows that there's not much evidence that there's this education in a long-term meaningful way, okay? Um, so I don't think it is worth it. I think there's other ways to educate p um, kids and people about animals. Um, one might be, as I, I, so I was talking to somebody at dinner before, was <clears throat> to educate people about why these animals are here because of what we're doing to their habitats and to wild populations. That could be very educational. Once again, I'm not sure that we need to keep these animals in cages to do that, but maybe that is something. The conservation card, to me, is more difficult to, um, to reconcile. There's a lot of zoos who do make F, um, contributions to conservation projects. They, they just do. Once again, I don't know that they need to have captive animals, but you know, one argument is that people pay to come to the zoos and that money goes to conservation um, 
uh, different conservation projects all over the world, okay? So to me, the bottom line that we need to ask is, are there other ways to achieve these goals without keeping animals in zoos, okay? I, I think there are, but some people may disagree. Another major problem is that our behavior hasn't caught up with, quote, the science. And this is a point that we make in our book, The Animal's Agenda. We call it the knowledge translation gap. So this may surprise you, but the Federal Animal Welfare Act in the United States redefined the word animal to exclude lab rats and lab mice. And people look at me like, oh, you know, what have you been drinking or something like that? But the fact of the matter is there's a quote in the Animal Welfare Act that says we have, de redef we have defined animal to exclude rats of the genus ratus, lab rats, and mice of the genus mus, lab mice. You try explaining to a young kid <laughs> the idiocy of that. You say, oh no, you know, your pet rat isn't really an animal. It blows their minds. I mean, they don't, I mean, young kids don't know what to say. They'll go, well, surely they're not plants. Who are they? But this is one example. The other example is that this field of cognitive ethology that I uh, study in called the study of animal minds is, is every day I get emails from scientific research on the cognitive and emotional lives and moral lives of non-human animals, how clever they are, how emotional they are, and how moral they are. They live by certain rules of conduct, codes of conduct, and if you violate them, animals can get thrown out of their groups. I've seen this with wild coyotes, for example. Okay, just once again, go to a dog park and see what happens to that rambunctious, obnoxious dog who doesn't play by the rules. Okay, so this is just very frustrating in the sense that what we know is not being used on behalf of other animals. Some people will say, oh, we just learned this. No, actually, some of the data we have are 20 years old, and they still have not been incorporated. And as far as I know, mice and rats have always been animals for millions of years. So people say, well, why, why do they do this? It's very self-serving. There's a, the animal industrial complex where there's a lot of money involved in breeding these animals for research, and scientists themselves don't want to stab themselves in the foot, if you will, because then if rats and mice and other non-human animals are c considered to be animals, then we will have to protect them more, okay? So I'll end off with just a discussion of what Jessica and I do in this book called The Animal's Agenda. We argue that the science of animal welfare should be replaced with the science of animal well-being. Welfareism, as it's typically practiced, puts human needs first. So there have, been, there have been changes for the positive within animal welfare science. I think it would be wrong to say that there haven't been some positive changes, but they really haven't been enough because the bottom line is that we'll make these changes as long as we can do what we need to do to these animals. Sometimes it's very friendly interactions and sometimes it's horrifically invasive. The science of animal well-being basically plays off of the science of compassionate conservation where individuals count, okay? So that's really why we wrote the book. We, we consider animals in factory farms, lab animals, um, animals in zoos, entertainment animals, and um, companion animals or pets, including wild animals. You know, to say that an animal is wild doesn't necessarily mean they're free. A lot of wild animals are not very free. They're wild in a sense. They've never been in captivity. They're not domesticated, but they're not free. So our book really focuses on the notion of freedom and giving animals, if you will, all the degrees of freedom that we can. And sometimes this means that there's things that <clears throat> we might want to do, <coughs> but we can't because we're encroaching on their freedom. So I'll just end off saying, you know, thank you for coming. Um, I'm just going to repeat something that I said before because as a field biologist and someone who's been doing this for a really long time, I just love our planet. There's remarkably good people out there working on behalf of 
if you will, of diverse ecosystems and the fascinating animals with whom we share our planet. But the planet's tired. There's, you know, we're living in the Anthropocene. People call it the Anthropocene, the age of humanity, and I like to call it the rage of inhumanity. Unprecedented extinctions, for example. We're just going all over the place. We're trespassing into the homes and the hearts of other animals. We need to remember this. We need to remember that these are feeling beings. And I'm probably preaching to the converted, to most of you, and I'm preaching to the converted if you share your house with a dog or a cat or another companion animal. Scientists, like I said before, don't like using the word heart. It's soft. The other point is that scientists have to be advocates. I gave a talk in Australia a few years ago and I called it, would you kill your dog for fun? And they expected 50 people to come and 300 came. And I understand why. <laughs> I'd like to believe they were coming to hear me, but I think the title was a grabber. But there was a guy in the audience and I was talking about that because they kill kangaroos for fun. They do these headlight beer drinking parties. Maybe you've seen these or heard about them. You head like kangaroos, they get stunned and they shoot them. At the end of my talk, some guy stood up and said, you're a scientist. You have to be objective. You can't be an advocate. So I knew who the person was. Really nice guy. He's one of these examples of a really nice, good guy who does horrible things. And I said, look, I'm an advocate for the kangaroos and you're an advocate against them. And the lecture hall got really, really quiet. And so as a practicing scientist, you've got to use what you know on behalf of the other animals. Some people don't, but to say that you should not be an advocate for the animals, but it's okay to be an advocate against them, is it's kind of playing the middle from both ends, and I, I don't really like that. So anyway, I'm going to end off now. I really thank you all for coming, and I'd just like to say that we need to remember that non-humans need all the help they can get. So thank you very much. I, I don't know if you remember this, but we were on a panel together about 20 years ago, and it was the first time we had met. It was at a PAUSE conference. Yeah. And you called me an activist. Uh, yeah, you, I did. You were, you were shocked. Uh, How so mistaken. I don't know whether no. <laughs> we're in, I don't know where in the range of advocate activists. I don't know where that falls. But um, the other thing is, you mentioned that there are a lot of people that um, you know say that when they were young they went to a zoo and that that shaped their future and they became biologists. Um, I think I was a junior in college before I went. It was the first time I went to a zoo. Um, I was so appalled. Um, it's remarkable that I actually work in this field, but a lot has indeed changed. Um, anyway, Mark has been very gracious because he will uh, answer uh, several questions, but there are many of you that want uh, him to sign your book, and you probably would like to shake his hand too. Um, and so we won't take too long doing this, but uh, we've got mics. Please don't grab the mic. Raise your hand. We have people in the, uh, our staff. Julie? Um, hi, uh, my name is Ruth, uh, and I actually just finished my Master's of Fine Art thesis. Um, so I'm a visual artist that makes art with cows. Um, so your writing and uh, work has been very informative, so thank you for your amazing you. talk. Um, so you talk about uh, like emotions being the universal language of all species, and um, for the past two years, I've been drawing out these connections between a somatic experience and how that helps us connect with animals. Um, and zoos are one of the places that we are not able to reach out and physically touch the animal. So what do you propose as a, a placeholder for that? Um, uh, as, as like a placeholder for that? Um, because, I, you know, working with domesticated species... Um, they're very present, especially in this part of Michigan. So, um, yeah, I'm just wondering if you can talk about that a little bit. Like, what do we do when we can't reach out and, and touch an animal, and how do we empathize with them? Well, f for me, as a field worker, 
by, I mean, by observing them, by watching them carefully, you know, paying attention. Um, for people who don't have that opportunity, like watching the squirrels in the park, um, people watching dogs. Um, I just finished a book on dog behavior, and I spend a lot of time at dog parks. And not only are they psychological and sociological disasters sometimes. <laughs> I mean, some of the things that go on at dog parks are amazing between the people themselves. But, um, but by carefully watching, I, I really, by observation, you know, becoming a keen observer. You know, as an artist, you know how important it is to just watch. And, and that's where patience comes in. I mean, it, when we did an eight and a half or nine year field study of coyotes living outside of Jackson Hole in the Grand Teton National Park, and I'll bet you it took probably two, three hundred hours for us to, I mean, I knew coyote and wolf behavior. I'd done some of the work before, but with my students, before they had any idea of what was going on. And after almost 5,000 hours of watching them, we were still learning something. But we had the basics down. And when I studied penguins, you know, people go, oh, those little Adelie penguins, they're all the same. No, they have personalities, and you learn to identify the, them. You know, the bold and timid ones is ones who would run up to us, and their wings are bone. And I got just smashed in my tibia, and almost broke it. And you could almost see that the penguins were laughing. They just will show this, whoever this other animal is. But careful observation and becoming them. I like to say the seer becomes the scene. And it means just trying to learn as much as you can about the lives of these animals, getting into their heads, their hearts, their paws. I really, really mean that. So I don't know if that answers your question. I'd like to believe these two kids in New York learned something. <laughs> oh. oh, good. Um, I'm interested, um, as an average person trying to help animals, about what I can do. And specifically, there are so many animal welfare organizations out there, like World, uh, what is it, World Wildlife? World, or World w Wildlife Fund? WWF mm -hmm. and other places like that. And I don't know which ones to trust in the sense that I'm, I suspect that a lot of the money goes to um, support human interests <coughs> more than, or human salaries and that kind of thing, as opposed to animal welfare. So I'm asking you, which organizations do you know about that are good, good ones, good recipients for our money and our time and effort? I'll be honest with you that I, I usually don't answer that question. And the reason I don't is because, first of all, I don't know enough about a whole lot of organizations. I'll tell you one organization I work with extensively is called Animals Asia. And I know about them because I go to China and I, hope, I help rehabilitate these bears who are caught in this um, bear bile industry, okay? Um, and I'm not saying bear bile. They, um, they're on bear farms and they, well, example, one of my boyfriends, Jasper the bear, lived in a cage this, the size of this for 15 years and he was bigger than this cage. So they put a catheter in the gallbladder and they drip it and they all go crazy psychologically. They all suffer, they all suffer from uh, liver cancer. They bite the cage. A woman named Jill Robinson actually gave a talk here yesterday. So are they the only, quote, good organization? No, hardly, but I know them. And so that's, that's really all I can say, okay? I, yeah, and I'll just tell you why because I recommended some organizations about 10 years ago, and I should not have, where a lot of the money just went into administration, and people want to give the money to, that goes directly to the animals. There's always administrative costs and stuff like that. So, I'm I sorry. have a, a question. I agree very much so with your point of the individuals of the animals. Um, and my lowest point, when I think that many are going extinct, I think, well, that's something maybe I can't, do anything with, but each individual is having a problem as that happens also. So, but I have a question for you. You said about um, the culling, or as they say, for to save one species versus another, but how, what would you say to be done there? Well, I mean, one thing I like, and I, and I realize it may be idealistic, is going into a hands-off policy. I mean, a lot of the programs that have been used, a lot of the programs where you kill members of one species to save another have not worked. I mean, they, they just really haven't. There may be a short-term solution, you know, but, but they really haven't worked. And so, 
I think my, my view is a very long-term view because I, it took so long, if you will, to have these problems arise. The solutions aren't going to come overnight. But I think a hands-off policy would also mean saving habitat, you know, for other animals. You know, so killing cormorants to save salmon, number one, it isn't going to work and it hasn't worked. And number two, I mean, I, I don't know, it's just unfair. I mean, it, all cormorants don't kill salmon. So I'm just saying that maybe, maybe the future is going to have to involve just our accepting the fact that things happen out there that we don't like, but maybe it's not our job to fix, try to fix them. And I, I'm not saying that that is my final answer, but that's kind of having spent so much time in the field working on animals like coyotes who are persecuted, right, and wolves. It's just... This, the, you know, having the killing fields out there just hasn't worked. You know, people kill coyotes on the stage and new coyotes come in from the audience, for, for example. So that, that's my answer. And it's kind, of a sweeping, it's kind of a sweeping conclusion that the killing just has to stop. But that's kind of my attitude. And I'm willing to listen to other people. And certainly the people who choose to kill members of one species either to save another or members of the same species, use the most horrific ways ever to kill them. Nothing humane about poisons and snaring and trapping and shooting. Okay, we're going to take two more questions because otherwise we'll lose people who want Mark to sign their book. So, uh, first year. Isn't the point behind killing the cormorants to save the salmon because as humans we have a greater interest in the salmon in the same way that killing harbor seals because we have a greater interest in the fish yeah. that they're eating? Yeah, <clears throat> it's in the name of the humans. No, exactly. And, and, and that's what a lot of conservation comes down to. There's, there's, there's different schools of conservation now, so compassionate conservation would be one. The new conservationists is basically humans come first. They just, that's it. And, and that's not going to solve the problems either. Yeah, but you're right, you're exactly right. Um, I've been trying to figure out how to phrase this into a question, maybe just a statement, but on your level of research and work, is there any thought of the humane conservation as how it pertains to the industrial agriculture complex that we have going on, mm -hmm. that if we stopped that or limited that or reduced that a great deal, we'd have a whole lot more space and, and resources to let animals just be who they are. Yep. And two, is there a concern with Sonny Perdue, now as the head of Secretary of <laughs> Agriculture, we're gonna take a step <laughs> backwards in everything that we've... Yeah, there's know, a huge concern, you know, what, believe me. The king of industrial agriculture now right. controlling it. Yeah, yeah, there, there definitely is. I mean, if people choose to eat animals, non-human animals or animal products, they don't have to eat factory farm. That's, that's just the beginning. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, factory farm should be just closed tomorrow. That would be it. It would free up animals. It would free up land. Okay, so, yeah. Um, compassionate conservation doesn't necessarily get into that, if you will, because it's more geared, if you will, to wild animals and animals kept in zoos, you know, who were wild or you hope will become wild. But, yeah, I think your question is a really, really... It's a really good question. And there are so many, there would be so many positive effects to just shutting down the animal industrial complex right now. Nobody has to eat a factory farmed animal or a product from a factory farmed animal. You don't have to. There's other alternatives, okay? But that would be, that would be a wonderful beginning. And it would be enormous for climate change, too. And it would be enormous for climate change, yeah. and there's parts of eastern North Carolina that are uninhabitable because of pig farms. How about one more question? Okay, one a more question. How about a good positive... No, <laughs> no I ahead. know. Go ahead, Alexis. I, I'm going to try to articulate this, but I've just really enjoyed so much of what you said. Um, as an educator... Um, I know sometimes kids are so disconnected from nature, and it's not just the technology, it's just the cities that they live in and that kind of thing. So this concept of rewilding, um, I also am a docent here at the zoo, and I see the 
awe mm -hmm. on their faces, as I do. And to me, it seems like the zoos are kind of a way of rewilding, mm -hmm. I mean, of waking up that interest. So I'm wondering, and that's something that you said about how when we see pandas at zoos, or we forget about what's happening in the wild. So I'm just wondering how we can continue that sense of awe. And I'm wondering about, maybe you could answer that because of Jane Goodall's program. I mean, obviously we can't take inner city kids to Africa. Mm -hmm. So can you do that without <coughs> experiencing what an animal looks like, sounds like, up close? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question, and I'm not sure there's an easy answer to it. There's excellent, I mean, there really are excellent documentaries. There's, I mean, I, I went online once when I was writing my dog book to look at videos of dogs playing. I mean, I'd studied dog play for years. I just wanted to see what was going on, and I could have spent the next year watching videos of dogs playing. There's some excellent PBS videos, um, and to me, you know, the question comes down is that, is engendering that sense of awe worth keeping certain animals in captivity? But, and this is a new idea, and I know Ron, I hadn't thought about it, but I started off saying that you could get rescued animals into a zoo, and then sometimes they're not as pretty, sometimes they're injured, but not only would you see a member of a species, and I'm sure some would look just fine, but it would explain why they're there, okay? Why is this wolf there who was trapped, for example, or an elephant who's suffering and there's no place else to go. And that would be converting zoos into more rescue centers and sanctuaries. But I think the question that you're asking is a really good one, is how do you develop that sense of awe and wonder? Um, Jane and I did a great project in um, Denver. It seems like it was yesterday, but it was a number of years ago where we went to an inner city high school as part of this Roots and Shoots program, the kids there were rat ecology and behavior experts. It's because their homes were just filled with rats. It, was, I, it touched me. These, they couldn't wait to tell me stuff that I didn't know about because they were becoming local ecologists and ethologists, if you will. And so, did that engender some kind of sense of awe? I, I don't really know, but I can tell you right now they knew a lot more about rat population biology than I did. Some of them just came up with marking some of them with a little nail polish, and they'd be shocked at the regularity. They're, they're, you know, one guy was talking about their time and activity budgets, and he said, yeah, like Rosie comes here all the time. Rosie had a big red dot on her head. You know, and when she runs into Harry, they fight, or they court, or they play. So, you know, that could be one way. But, I mean, I think your question is a, is a really good one. And teachers can do more. They, they, you know, yeah. Let's give a round of applause to Mark. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. What are we doing?